Hi, everyone. So excited to be here together. And I have to say, I think I am particularly the most excited. I know there's great buzz already about this panel, this conversation. But for me personally, I am so honored to have three incredible men uh, to have this conversation about women and how do we really flip the script, flip the balance, and move forward with equality and intentionality. So welcome to all three of you incredible male champions, Emmanuel, Nick, and Michael. Welcome. Thank you. Thank this, you. this conversation is um, titled Finding Male Champions, the Role of Men in Promoting Female Leadership in Sport, which is a wonderful title. And, and I really love to say it really is a leadership issue and leadership is still predominantly men and caregiving is still predominantly women. So we find ourselves in these challenges. I think that you are leadership champions, not just male champions. So welcome to leadership. So let's start with telling me who you are, what you do, and let's, let's go broad at the beginning, which is what do you think the greatest barriers for women in work are today? And then we'll move into sport. But let's start in general. How about that? And before we go, I want everyone to know that both that all three, Emmanuel, Nick, and Michael have all agreed to get a little uncomfortable together. So I like that as my nickname, Chief Troublemaker. I'm well known to break the rules, create new ones. Let's break some rules, get a little uncomfortable, because the only way we're truly going to move forward is to unlock some of our challenges so that we truly create can create solutions for change. Emmanuel, let's start with you. Well, first of all, Shelley, let me let me let me say that I love the way you have introduced this discussion. You know, and referring to yourself as chief troublemaker, I can see some resemblance because <laughs> I have been uh, called the same all, all my life. You know, when I was twenty, when I was uh, uh, twenty-three, when I when I challenged the Portuguese Bar Association because I wanted to have full democracy and accountability when I set up the Association of European Football Leagues against the predominance of monolithic organizations such as FIFA and UEFA. And now with SIGA, again, we are making troubles. And making troubles in this case is challenging the status quo, challenging the norm, thinking out of the box. And sport is this space where we can feel comfortable having uncomfortable conversations about uncomfortable truth, but feeling comfortable because we cannot accept sport being um, being lost in time, governed and uh, operating with standards of the 19th century when we are in the 21st century. And that implies governance. And governance means that we need to have a climate uh, that favors respect and dignity for all those who want to have a role whether they are men or women, regardless of their gender, the color of their skin, the social background. This is the sport that I have been fighting for for the last 30 years. And, and it's not exclusive. But the fact that sport remains uh, in a silo, uh, in an environment of uh, denial, this wall of denial that uh, does not acknowledge the problem and does not move towards the solution, is a big deterrent. This culture, this male-dominated culture, like we're still in the uh, Middle Ages, um, that uh, does not create the conditions to have equal opportunities. I have spent the uh, whole the weekend assessing the governance of eight international federations. And the reality is staggering. It's shocking. In 2019, we had uh, female representation, uh, the highest executive organs of international federations uh, of 18.3%, unacceptable. But in 2021, we have 178 and that's a massive drop. How can we be happy with that? How can we uh, walk tall in a sector that is still, uh, is still so anachronic and, and still does not create uh, the set of rules that favors equal rights and equal opportunities for everyone. It's not exclusively a sport, but sport is by far one of the most resilient and um, 
and, uh, and obsolete sectors in this field. And this is why we want to prioritize this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, struggle with leaders like yourselves, with champions like yourselves, because everyone uh, must be involved and no one is one too many to win this cause. Well, thank you so much for that, Emmanuel, because what you have pointed out is that we are going backwards. And with all the conversations we are having, you know, we are still going backwards. So by hopefully the end of this conversation, we are going to have a very important conversation of what it will take to create progress and to go forward. So thank you. And, and one of the things, you know, I want to talk about too is allyship, because we talk about allies. I think we have to move from allyship to activism, to activists. Uh, which I think will go a long way. Nick, hi, how are you? Hi, uh, Shelley, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for hosting and moderating this. Um, I'm Nick Patel, I'm chair of a government agency in England called Sport England. And our role is basically to get more people taking part in sport and physical recreation. I'm also, for which of course I apologize, I'm a lawyer as well. Um, currently a um, consultant at an American law firm in London, and I have a number of well-known sports clients, including people like Wimbledon Championships and UEFA. Um, and I'm also chief executive of the London Marathon. You know, in, in your opening, you asked, um, why is there the disparity in society generally, rather than just for sport? And, you know, the reasons are quite well known. Um, it's the expectation that women have been given by men, uh, the expectation that is inherent in their upbringing, in schools, it's reinforced throughout society and the media. Time and time again, uh, women are depicted as uh, the homemaker, the caregiver for children, the caregiver to those who perhaps uh, elderly members of the household, um, and the, the expectations in terms of uh, employment from school, when they say, uh, what is it that you should think about doing with your lives. But we can't hide behind uh, what um, Emmanuel called the male dominated culture because sport is worse than, or has been traditionally worse than the general culture. You know, if you look at whether it's Fortune 500 or um, in Britain, um, our equivalent, actually measures have been put in place. It's not, they're not brilliant, but they have been put in place to start addressing this. And it's only recently, and I'm sure we'll come on to this later, that sport has decided it needs to do something about it. And we've got long-term, deep-seated issues of misogyny within sport that have to be addressed. You know, it's funny when you talked about Wimbledon. I was at, I was at Wimbledon when McEnroe beat Borg. And talk about cultural nuance too. I was in the stands and I was a tennis player and I was like screaming, go Mac, go Mac. And someone turned around and they said, excuse me, but you're not at an American football game. <laughs> talk about the cultural differences as well. It just made me smile when you talked about <laughs> Wimbledon. But um, one of the things we're gonna talk about is what Emmanuel brought, brought up. We are going backwards. And what you just brought up that sport is even a greater divide than in workplace in general. Uh, Michael, hello, welcome. Thank you, hello. Tell us hello. who you are, what you do, and what you really think some of the greatest barriers for women are today. Well, this is a, a great conversation. Thank you for having me. Uh, I work at MasterCard and I, I work with our uh, global sponsorships programs around the world. Uh, we do many different things in that space. Uh, hopefully a lot of people have seen them. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's an ongoing problem that, that we obviously have to be talking about. And I think with any of the problems we've got today going on, you know, really around the world that are very visible, uh, I'm a firm believer that the first step is talking about it. And I think we, we do get uncomfortable and it is uh, something that we tend to shy away from because we don't want to offend anybody, say the wrong thing. Uh, so the words obviously are important that we use and, and having the conversation is, is a big part. And with that, it also means listening. And I think that's an area that as, as men in this conversation, the biggest thing I've tried to do is, uh, and it doesn't come naturally, is to, is to shut my mouth and listen and, you know, ask questions and, and look at it. We, you know, we all inherently look at things from our experience and points of view and the way we've lived our lives. 
and since if you're a man and you, you won't understand a, a woman's perspective, you have to ask. And you have to be comfortable in the right place in the right way to, to say, well, how would this affect or should we be thinking about it differently? And I think areas like that are at least on a fundamental day to day basis. Anybody can do anywhere. Um, I w- and as I always ask women, don't assume we know, um, you know, don't assume that we see it or, or if we see it, that we know what to do to fix it or have an idea or a thought. And I do think, well, you know, what Nick was saying, the, 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 the systematic uh, area, certainly, you know, in the live life I've seen is this, is this caregiver versus employment? Um, you know, is it still perfect? Definitely not. It needs a lot of work. And I think even as you just see someone go on maternity leave, how is that addressed? Uh, the idea of a stay at home dad, I'm very fortunate. I have several friends that are, that are the stay at home dad and the, and the wife is uh, not just the primary, the sole, the sole income. And i watch how that life goes. And I think that needs more respect. And I actually read an article about that. I think until the stay at home dad is viewed in society as the respectable, uh, honorable, great, whatever you want to say thing to do, um, then you really can't have equality because the, you won't, you won't have that choice that, uh, that, uh, that a family can make and it should be their choice to decide how they live their life. And if that's how they want to do it, that's great. And, and I've seen it and I've seen it work wonderfully. Um, so things like that, I think, uh, you know, get into that broad space. As far as sports go, a lot of work needs to be done and a lot of conversation need to be had and a lot of uh, money needs to be needs to be focused and channeled. And we need to look at each and every situation. Why is it that way and, and how can it change? Thank you for, for sharing so vulnerably. And, you know, one of the things I just want to level set when you talked about caregiving and maternity leave, um, while women take maternity leave and when companies have elective paternity leave, less than 24% of men will take full paternity leave. Why? Because they feel it shows a sign of weakness. And so until we get to parental leave and maybe mandatory parental leave, uh, we will continue to see that bias barrier of motherhood, you know, kick in. But Michael, you talked about something and I want to go there where you said you need to listen. And we talked about sport being a a bigger ding for women. You know, we've got ding one in the workplace in general, and then uh, really the misogynistic environment in sport in particular. But you said you all need to listen and hear. What are you hearing? So when you are now in a very conscious listening mode, what are some of the things you are hearing? Uh, the, my, my favorite example is, and I, I, you know, we'll probably talk about golf. Uh, that's one of those traditional places. And I was playing golf and I was playing at an LPGA. Uh, so I was, I was asking the player, uh, one of the top players, I was just asking her questions, you know, how does this work? Why is it this way? And I wouldn't have thought of certain things. And she gave me this amazing answer. And I said, you know, if, as a brand, if we were to come in and partner, we, we do work with, uh, you know, a player and we've worked around it is what could we do? And, you know, she made a point of a brand that did great thing. And it was doing a balance between what they do on the men's tour and what they do on the women's tour. And she goes, that's great. And we're appreciative and thankful that they are, they've created this equality between their two activities, but it doesn't, it doesn't exactly fit the, the woman, right? It's more of a man saying what she, and I said, well, what, what could a brand do? And she really talked about the independent contractor status of say tennis or golf, or again, it comes down to money. And it talked about maternity leave and it talked about, uh, going to have children, whether it's adopted or, 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 or naturally, the notion of supporting these independent people that can't play, there's no backstop, there's no financial benefit. So is that now actually holding back? And it's just, it's just probably for most women, they're looking at me going, well, of course, you know, why hadn't you thought of that? And you know, I don't have children, but it just didn't come naturally. And it was like so obvious that why wouldn't, you know, a brand come in and make a program and say, great, for all women on maternity leave, here's, here's how we can support that. And who wouldn't agree with that and, and the other player. So it wasn't about an equality of performance on the course or on the, on the, on the pitch. It was more specific to that. And, and it just, just one of those things that just reminded me, I have to, you have to ask more questions, especially when you're dealing with some shy people that maybe feel they're uncomfortable. Maybe I am asking the right question, but they're a little uncomfortable answering it or they don't want to look weak. Um, so just keep, keep finding and probing, you know, lawyers are good at that, but it's just keep asking always around, well, what if it was this way? Is that the right way? And, and that just, just reminds me all the time to just keep asking more questions. So evolution yeah. of policies, you know, which will go a long way, but you also brought up golf. And so, you know, Emmanuel and Nick, do you play golf? 
I've acted in golf. I acted for, for the Ryder Cup and European Tour for many years, but I'm a terrible golfer. But, but can I just come back to something that Michael was talking about, which is listening? Um, what, one of the things that we saw with Sport England uh, over a number of years was the massive diversity uh, in the number of girls against boys playing sport. And I think we, along with most of the world really, had made certain assumptions about why that was. So we decided to challenge those assumptions and we asked. And we did a massive listening exercise to find out why it was that young girls in particular who were playing sport at primary school at the entry school level, but weren't later on. And why was that? And what we discovered was the primary reason was that women feared being judged when they were playing sport. They thought that people would think lesser of them because it, they were being uh, boyish because they were pursuing it or how they looked uh, didn't fit into a cultural stereotype perhaps. And that fear of being judged was the number one reason. It led to us running a massive campaign, I, I'm pleased to say an award-winning campaign called This Girl Can, stressing why it is that girls can and should be seen in a positive way when they're playing sport. And that really, in a very short time, helped to close the gap between the number of boys and girls playing sport. And that's important because one of the reasons that women are so underrepresented at senior leadership within sport is they're not perhaps have the history of taking part in that sport in the same numbers. They're not represented at club levels the same way as men. So you have to go back really to beginning uh, and the right at the start of what are the motivations uh, for uh, which are causing those differences and try to address those. That's a longer term piece. And I'm sure we're going to come on to some of the shorter term measures that we can put and have put in place to try and address this as well. First of all, thank you so much for bringing that up because that is a, a true um, representation matters. Confidence starts at the age of five. And I'm the co-founder of See Her. If you can see her, you can be her. And so the more we also see women, you know, successful women in sport, the more young girls will have that as inspiration and aspiration they'll have role models and you know part of the problem is media representation so we we can talk about the long-term stereotypical you know ingrained notions and then we can go to short low-hanging fruit and so we're going to get to those very important emmanuel tell me what you hear when when you're listening i hear that uh, the time for action has come I don't want to sound presumptuous, but I'm fed up of, of hearing, hearing excuses, hearing euphemisms, hearing reasons, the more grandiloquent and irritated reasons to continue to postpone the inevitable. And the inevitable is that we must assume accountability for our own affairs. I think we cannot bear any, any inch of dignity if we allow this climate of uh, prejudice of discrimination, be it based on gender or race or religious belief or whatever. We must not, and by we, I don't mean the governments or the international organizations, or those who are very, uh, very impressive with their uh, grand speeches in grand occasions. And then my concern is what's gonna happen after the International Women's Day. Because gender equality and respect for human rights, which involves women's rights, is not ending on the 9th of March. And this is why symbolically we are not just dedicating the 8th of March, we are dedicating three days. And that is just a drop in the ocean. So I am fed up of all this. And at my age, I should perhaps conform. But I will never surrender. I will never give in and I will never give up. And you know why? because I'm a free man, and, and I'm a free man who owes so much to the woman that influenced my mentality and the way I act. My grandmother, my mother, my wife, uh, even my daughter, who challenged me <laughs> you know, from time to time, they are teaching us powerful lessons. And the lesson for us men is that there is no reason to be afraid, because it's fear, it's fear and 
ultimately weakness that drives all these walls, you know, these uh, boys clubs, uh, even the attitude that we have to boys, you know, we, this, this society, you know, when we say men up, you know, be bold, be a leader. We, we sometimes do not think the pressure that this creates over the, the new generations of boys and girls. I think it's time for us to relax and do the right thing. And doing the right thing has a lot to do with storytelling. There is nothing more inspirational than listening to you, uh, Shelley. How you plan your day, how you strategize the way to accomplish your goals, how you overcome the hurdles, your obstacles, difficulties, how you motivate yourself and motivate others around you, how you prioritize in a way that you can achieve results because nothing is more powerful than results. And this has always been on our mind. In 2018, when I was crossing the, uh, the skies on the plane, as I normally would, and I said, what can I do? Without presumption, but also without the false modesty, because what can I do to, to uh, change the needle? And that led us to organize a special session where we invited 20 uh, leaders uh, in the industry just to tell their story. And by that, they would inspire others, men and women and girls, to feel empowered, to feel that they too, they could make the difference. And that led us to have on our universal standards precise uh, requirements so that the composition of the executive committees, those that hold the power, you know, the top table where decisions are made, would not discriminate anyone, be they, uh, uh, you know, based on gender or, 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 or race or any other factor. And that led us also to design a system that ensures accountability, scrutiny and oversight in an industry that has been a desert so far. And this is the SIGA uh, independent rating system serves, which will be triggered and is now underway in a pilot project so that organizations can show, can walk the talk, not just, not just talk the talk, but walk the talk. So there is a lot, a lot to be done. But I will, I will finish by saying this. You may agree or disagree with what I'm saying. And I am humble enough to know that sometimes the smartest thing is to change opinion, in particular when you're wrong. But also, we must believe in what we're saying. And above all, we must lead by example. And this is why uh, in December, I proposed to the SIGA Council that we would, within the SIGA uh, statutes and organs, observe not a not a quota of 10, 15% like we're giving something because we are generous. It is ridiculous when I see uh, sports organizations, you know, bragging about we have a uh, provision in our statutes that grants one woman per continent to sit on our table. It's ridiculous and it's shameful. And I am also not happy with 10 or 15%. And I have struggled a long time with this idea about the quotas because I felt that the quota in itself is a stigma. And I want the composition of the, of the executive organs and the, and the board to be based on merit, quality, excellence, and human qualities rather than, than an artificial factor as a percentage. But to make a long story short, us from April onwards and all SIGA internal organs, we will have a 50-50 rule, absolute um, uh, parity between genders. And I think this will also be a powerful example that if we do, others can and others should. Well, I think, Nick, I'm coming to you. I see that you have a comment to jump in. But, you know, I think one of the things we say is you can't treasure what you can't measure. So the whole concept of accountability, I think, will go a long way. So thank you for sharing. I hope your daughter is watching. She will be so proud of you and so inspired. And I think that's really leaving a legacy, leaving a legacy while you're alive. You know, and I think this is a responsibility that we have. And I think it's also a choice that we can make. It's, it's not that complicated. Nick, come no. on in. Um, well, I'm delighted to hear what uh, Emmanuel is talking about. But the difficulty is 
They have no powers to enforce that and put that into action for their members. And, and what we need is for those who have influence to ensure that those type of measures are taken up. So for instance, uh, in 2016, Sport England, along with our colleagues at UK Sport, introduced a code of governance for those organizations that we fund. And we said, we will not fund you unless you meet certain actions and targets. Now, one of those targets was 30% gender uh, parity. And that was a starting point because like Emmanuel, if you looked at it beforehand, it was around about 16 to 17%. Within three years of it coming into force, uh, we're now at over 35%. In fact, we're very nearly 40%. And the next iteration of the Code of Governance, which we'll be announcing uh, hopefully next month, we'll start to see that move even further. And that's because we've got the ability to say, if you want our money, then that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. But we're only part of the picture. And uh, my challenge to people like uh, Michael and others is, where, what's the attitude of sponsors? What's the attitude of governments who are hosting events, uh, who are really important in this uh, ecosystem uh, for sport? We've all got a part to play in ensuring that organisations change. And it, um, unfortunately, at the moment, not enough people are, in effect, putting their money where their mouth is. So let's go there. Money where your mouth is, because it is about intentionality. I always say equality um, is, is a business imperative, but it's also a choice. We all have the choice. Unconscious bias is an excuse. Equality is a choice. Unconscious bias is an excuse. If we are conscious, we have the right to make decisions. So let's put our money where our mouth is. Michael, MasterCard, you know, how are you, you know, putting your money where your mouth is and ensuring that we are moving forward with progress, with positivity, with proactivity, and obviously with equity for all? Sure. And, and let me start. I mean, we still have a long way to go. So anything I say is is certainly not the uh, the end. It's it's really just the beginning. But it's it's for us and for maybe me personally that day, it's just, are we making it a point? Are we calling a meeting that says, let's sit down and look at our portfolio. Let's have a discussion. Are we where we need to be? Have we, have we let's think about it. And, and there are a lot of women on my team and I've, I've usually worked for women in most of my marketing career, uh, but even we had to make it a point. So we sat down and said, okay, let's look at things. And I'll take something, a great partner we have at the RNA, they, they back to golf, but they, they run golf outside the U.S. and Martin Slumbers, the head of it, and number his number one priority is equity, uh, equality for women. And so he's got a women in golf charter. We were the first brand to sign on to it. We said, great, what can we do? What does that mean? So we hosted an event. We, we brought leaders of women's golf um, into the conversation. Um, and there were some uncomfortable moments. Uh, there was little things, again, that are huge, uh, little, little to, from an action point of view, but make such a big statement. Um, but we basically decided if we're going to sponsor one thing for the men, are we, is there an equal uh, opportunity for us to sponsor there? And are we doing it? And if not, why? And let's go figure it out. Um, and then there are cases, I would say, in, in, in Europe, in, in football, there are clubs that we work with that are, that are absolute leaders in this. And, and I look at uh, Olympic Lyonnais. Uh, our big partner there, and, and Jean-Michel has been a, a champion of women for a long time, and I, I, I love that he was sort of honored by having the FIFA Women's World Cup at his at his stadium versus somewhere else, because he's been a champion, and he's putting his money where his mouth is by getting the best players, paying them as they should be paid, because they're top athletes, and we we want to embrace that and, and partner with that. Um, so we are looking for those opportunities. So we, we go step by step and we and every day we have to ask ourselves, is there more we could do? Is there something else? Um, and then I would say from and using the example of football, you know, look, when you're in the brand and you're in this value conversation, right, we have stockholders, we have a business plan to to fulfill and, and things that we're required to do for everybody that's that's a part of our business. And so one of the things gets down to this idea of value. So are you paying for something and getting your value in return? If we continue to look at it that way, we're never going to break the cycle. Because if you just look at football, which is Manuel's world or other places, if you go by TV ratings and fan base and those things, they're just not there yet. So we're asking ourselves, well, why is that? And the number one reason is it's not distributed. And I'm not doing this to blame the, the media partners. But if you can't see it, then you can't have the audience. So you can't come and charge us what it's worth. 
tennis, which we talked about before, has had a great record of equality over the years. Uh, I, I look at it from a U.S. point of view. Uh, and again, not negative to, to men's tennis in the U.S., but our top players have been women. Uh, the TV ratings are there. The audience is clearly there. The, so the value and the revenue is there. So they're getting paid as they should because they're driving the business. So it's, it's, it's an example that shows if the product's there and the quality's there, people will watch it and the, and the value will be there. Well, we need to look at that uh, uh, in other places. And, but I will say, in, in again, it's never enough. So let's, again, I'll say that again, it's never enough, but there are sports that we're partners with, whether it's world rugby or others that have broken out. It used to be, um, it used to be the women's sport was the throw-in. Oh, we'll sponsor this. And oh, by the way, you know, you get the women. Oh, oh what does that mean? And, do, you know, do people go to it? Like, do the, do the executives of the brand support it and attend? Uh, now they're breaking it out. And, and I love their attitude. Of course, they're charging us for it, which they should. But as a brand, that's uh, but they're basically saying, if you want the women, we want partners that want to sponsor and be an active partner of women. What does that mean? You bring in your ambassadors, you bring in your activation, you bring your customers, you treat it as you would what you've traditionally treated as the men's event. So they're breaking them out. And that is a big, that is a big step. Um, it's again, not enough, but it's a big step to basically say, we're now having a conversation because then you get to the next conversation. It's like, okay, well, why isn't it seen more? Why aren't more people attending? Are we in the right cities? Do we have the right audience? Are we marketing it correctly? All those things naturally come up because it's not the throw in anymore. It's the priority and you chose to be there. Um, so things like that are on the path of, of, of at least having the discussion and it is okay to break them out. And maybe that's some of the challenges too. You don't want to treat it differently. But I would argue you have to. You have to have um, you have to have that that focus uh, to make change. Well, I think we're back to intentionality and using words, which is so true. Let's throw it in. What perception does that make you feel? That it's not as worthy, it's not as valuable. And you use the word value. You know, we we say that diversity is good for business. So I, I want to ask you a question about value, and then I want to go, you know, really deep into you know solutions for change from the inside out and the outside in. You know, the outside in is media representation. And, and one of the things that is very clear on a global basis in sport is less than 4% of highlight reels feature women in sports. Hello, number one. So talk about value proposition. That should be something so intentionally easy to fix. And then inside out, the power of more women inside, not just on the court and in the ring, but also off the court, behind the scenes, women in the business of sports, and that's around closing the gaps. But I wanna start with the value. You use that word, it's a very important word. What value do you see women bringing to leadership in sports? The difference between your male leaders and your female leaders. Do you see a difference in how we lead and why we say that we need diversity, it's good for business, because it brings a different mindset, a different perspective to the table. Have you seen a difference in male, female leadership, both good, but different? Um, you know, I really think it comes down to the person and what their experience is. And, you know, I, 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 I again, I don't have children, but I, I go back to what Nick says. I, I've heard my whole life that sports and being a, a, a on a team or being a captain or even tennis, I played tennis, so you're by yourself, but the notion of practice, commitment, all those things are great for any person, right? And the fact that um, more girls haven't evolved or, or the situation hasn't allowed or whatever the, the dynamics that are, are, have caused that drop off, because I've seen so many young girls play sports and I know how great it is. And I, I again, I, that's not my area of expertise. But I think as you talk about leaders, the ones that did play sports, the ones that I know that played sports, maybe even were very successful in college, they, they bring a great presence. They bring a confidence that, that they, they don't back down. I mean, not, not that, uh, you know, you got to be able to, we love Emmanuel, but you got to be able to sit in the room and match his energy. You got to be able to sit there and go, you know, hold on, I, I don't agree with you. And I want to I wanna have a conversation about that. And that usually takes a, a, a level of, you know, leaning forward and participating and being active. And all the ones that, that I know, that I associate with, that I work with, uh, we don't, I guess I don't see it that way, uh, see it from a male, female. I just see it as they're present. They're, they're challenging. Uh, I have a lot of, you know, wonderfully strong people around me that know that the environment is, uh, if you have something to say, you should say it. If you have an idea, 
And maybe your personality is a little different. Maybe you take it off to the side, fine. Maybe you, you do it, you know, in the hallway versus in that 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 challenging a room. Uh, but but I think people that that have something to say and have an idea and have a thought, you know, we want to hear it. And that's I guess coming back to a little bit of what a role, you know, I, I am the, I am a man that's that's going to stay that way. So what what can I do in that situation? I can be conscious and make sure. Does is the room representative? Are the voices being heard? It's not just they're physically there or they're okay, good, 50% of the team is women, but 80% of the voices are men. Can't have that. So all those things on a day-to-day basis um, need to be thought of. And um, it's a challenge because maybe it doesn't come naturally, or even if it does, you think you're doing well, but you need to even, you have to try it harder. Well, if a woman did jump in with her opinion, would you call her bossy? No, (laughs) of course not gonna say it. No, like I said, I want an environment. Look, first of all, as I, as I start any conversation, usually when you talk about sports and entertainment, the reason we're here and the reason this industry exists around the planet is because of passion, right? This is all about passion. We either choose to play it, watch it, all the reasons that we know we're fortunate to be in this industry, that, that people spend their time and money. We all have to make uh, decisions in our life with our limited time and our limited dollars. And you generally, after you get through the basics of your life, you go to where your passions are. So these topics uh, lend themselves toward passion. So I expect, I, I am actually usually surprised if someone doesn't have passion. Like, well, why are you here? How, what is moving you? What is stirring you? Um, and I think uh, making sure that, that the, those passions are heard and come through uh, is good for everybody. And it doesn't matter the topic, but you, you, have, to, you have to be passionate. What does it say? Nothing, nothing ever happens until someone gets excited. Then you get changed. I think, I think the... Uh, or not by accident that you use that expression because in my view it's precisely one way of continuously stigmatizing uh, women in leadership positions you know if it, if it is a, if it is a man you wouldn't call him bossy we'd call him, oh he has a strong personality a true leader you know if it is a woman it's a bossy that that cannot be right that cannot be right fortunately things are changing you know and as we see in this web summit dedicated to female leadership you know, we have amazing female leaders across the whole industry, not just in not just in quantity, but, you know, in excellence. You know, uh, women who who have been pioneers, women who have trailblazed, who have pierced the gender glass ceiling and are now inspiring new generations of women, girls, but also men, because men must uh, be part of the equation and must evolve to. So I don't think that we... Uh, as opposed to in the past, we don't see uh, this 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 uh, uh, big differences be- between being a man or a woman in the workplace. Uh, but there's still a huge amount of work to do uh, to overcome unconscious bias and uh, and discrimination that still exists. And and allow me to to go back to the figures that I uh, that I exposed. Whether it is 18.3% in 2009 or 17.8% in 2021, that reality is unacceptable. So I urge every sport organization, including the International Sports Federations, to set the standards higher and to, to demand meaningful reforms, not just to ensure um, uh, gender e- equality, but also to ensure democracy, because in many organizations, we see leaderships perpetuating themselves endlessly. And there are still a number of examples. So how do we change this? It's not by adopting a passive attitude, it's adopting a proactive attitude and influence our community and bring others. And this is, this is something that I, I, I know, and I take my hat off to all of you because you have been championing for this cause for many, many years, and the future also depends on you. Uh, thank you. Nick, jump in, and then we're going to do a lightning round of next step solutions for change. Low-hanging fruit. Nick. Okay, what I was, all I was going to say is, I was going to try and answer your question, Charlie. The, the answer I would give, uh, sorry to break, break the mold and actually answer a question of yours, um, the answer I would give is I've seen both good and bad male and good and bad female leaders 
in sport and in business. I've just seen fewer bad women leaders because generally, because they have had to fight so hard to break through the glass ceiling, they have had to excel more than rather ordinary men uh, who have risen uh, partially because of who they know and who they play golf with and who they went to school with rather than any particular attributes. Um, but the value comes in the diversity of thought. You know, at, at one of my organizations, we use uh, color profiling. Some people call it uh, uh, Myers-Briggs profiling. You know, looking at the various attributes. And what you tend to find is that if it is a male-only board, it is very one-dimensional in your Myers-Briggs type of personality. It's very, very red in, in those terms. And the result is you do not have diverse thought. You do not have diverse boards. You have a very single set of board skills and less uh, wide uh, attributes that all good business needs. And that is what I think bringing women on board and also, of course, whether it's uh, other forms of diversity. I mean, we haven't spoken here about the absolutely disgraceful underrepresentation of black and Asian and disabled people in sports leadership around the world. Uh, so we, we absolutely have a lot of work to do on women, but we've even more to do in some of the other uh, characteristics when it comes to diversity. So true. Diversity is not just about gender, but race, age, religion, intersectionality, LGBT uh, ability. So I, I, wanna, I wanna wrap this conversation, but I do wanna part two because there is so much more that we have to, to do collectively together. Give me your, as male champions, and I wanna really say as leaders, you know, I don't care if you're a man or a woman, as leaders in sport, what is your next step? for accountability. And Michael, let's start with you. What's one thing that is low hanging fruit for you that you can do with intentionality? Um, boy, one, I would, I'd say we just have to keep pushing it. You have to keep asking, you have to keep making it a priority. I, I think, I mean, is it on your to-do list every day? Is it something you can affect change and uh, not just hope it works out or let somebody else do it, but what is it? Look, we're on the brand side. We have things that we sponsor. Um, what, what is it we can do? Where's the leadership? Where, where are the next uh, people I have seen through my career that um, it, it doesn't matter who the person is, but usually leaders get to higher positions because they were brought along somehow. They were trained. They were given opportunities. They were, it was a conscious thought to, to, to put them in positions to acquire the skills, the knowledge, the network, all the things it take to get someone to be a senior leader um, because it was an intention. It was the sort of just do it mentality um, so we, I'm, and I say that's for anybody. And if, if it's on the woman's side and I tell this to my team, have to have, have, be bold, come and ask, can I have another opportunity? Can I, can I do something different and get that experience? So when this position becomes available, I've earned it and I'm ready. Um, and sometimes again, it's just it, at any boss, right? Any boss, you have to tell them what your intentions are, your thoughts are. Uh, but, but just to make sure it's always on the fore and that we do this. I think this was a very comfortable conversation. This is what we should be doing and I think we need to keep doing it. Fantastic, thank you. Emmanuel. I, uh, low, low hanging fruit. Number one, review your governance systems. Ensure that you have proper the diversity and inclusion in the executive committee, which is fundamental, but at all levels with gender equality. Not tokenism, but meaningful gender equality. Second, empower. Empower women and involve other women who have pierced the gender glass ceiling to share their stories, to share their, their, their achievements and inspire the younger generations. This is what we are doing with, uh, with a trailblazing uh, program called the SIGA, a female leadership mentorship program. And now we have 100 women involved in this, uh, in this dynamo, um, uh, moving things forward and advancing. Uh, third, uh, embrace independent scrutiny. Don't just w uh, uh, talk, show that you are walking the talk because that is what leads credibility. And that is what the brands, the sponsors, the, uh, the broadcasters should be paying attention to when they sign the sponsorship contract 
and invest millions in sports organizations. They should also be at the forefront of this new culture where integrity and values are at the top. So I would say that uh, empower women and above all, lead by example. Lead by example. Deliver what you promise. Thank you. Nick, bring us home. Look, I've got a whole list of things that are on our shopping list of things that you have to do, from whether it's introduction of targets, creation of diverse board-ready candidate lists, uh, requirement on action plans, data transparency. But the one thing, ownership. Everyone in the leadership has a personal responsibility to ensure that our boards and our leadership you know, in sport are more diverse. So take that responsibility and take personal action. That's the one thing I would say. Well, you heard it here, the Zoom where it happens. It doesn't have to happen on a golf course. I think that this really was an amazing environment. Relationships are so important. Leadership matters. We all have the power to make a difference if we choose to. It is about intentionality not only from media representation, but on the inside, we need to close the gaps, the parity gaps, the policy gaps, the pipeline gaps, and the upskilling of people. But what it really also requires is true leadership, truly walking the talk, taking the next steps, not that complicated. Yes, we can if we choose to. So I just wanna thank you all. I am all in with you, you are fantastic. Thank you so much. I know that we don't have to wait 99.5 years to see equality in the season or 257 years to close the pay gap if we work together and we get comfortable being uncomfortable together because that's where true change happens. Thank you so much.